call the meeting to order. And we have everybody here except for David. So I want to start with the approval of the minutes and warrants. What do you want? Um, so warrants. Uh, you just need, you approved them all last week. You signed off on them last week, but you need to ratify them. They were like a week ahead, so if you can just ratify the ones that you approved last week, and that would be it. So I guess I need a motion for ratification of the warrants and for approval of the agenda and the minutes. So moved. Seconded. Any discussion? What is ratification? Just approving the fact that you signed them. You already signed them. Okay. So that and the, it was like a, just the motion part of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All right. So, recognition of groups or individuals. Hello, two people. Would you like to say anything at this point? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll yourself. tell you who I am. Yes. <laughs> you don't know me. I'm Franz Reitzman from the Brattleboro Representative Town Meeting Finance Committee. I'm here because I understand you're about to begin your budget consideration over the next month or so. So there's a lot of interested people who would like to hear about it, including our committee. Great. I don't, we did talk some last week. Actually, if you want to watch that on BCTV, we had a pretty <coughs> thorough, dis well, not thorough, but we dove into a couple ideas about the White House that you've heard us talk about before, an academy that's well past its expected life. And we talked a little bit about additional positions. Teacher leaders. Teacher leader compensation and what they do. And more yes, more. salaries. Yes, yes, that was a big yes. one. Thank you. So we'll watch that. Um, I've been working off the timetable that uh, Frank has been handing out at the high school yeah. finance committee meeting. So I, I thought tonight was the first discussion, but I'll make sure I watch the last meeting too. We were just kind there of, were no numbers. Yeah, it no was numbers. just it was just a, a discussion. It was kind of a guidance as they were starting to put things out. What mm -hmm. we might be already thinking. We want numbers. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, the conversation might be interesting to you. Okay. But yet there was there was discussion on salary with EES, and so there were some numbers involved. Okay. But I know tomorrow night is the SU meeting, where they will be doing the SU budget. Right. So. We don't have a completed draft yet of the first. Okay. First round. Where are you at? Uh, right. So I think well, then we'll jump in. And it, uh, sorry, did you want to introduce yourself and say anything too? No. Didn't. <laughs> <laughs> want to make sure. Okay. So then let's jump into any committee reports. I don't think there's another policy council since last week. And David's not here for energy committee. I don't think that's meeting anyway. Finance, you have anything more to say? No. I, I know that we did approve the um, job description for the superintendent, okay. and that will go to the SU board tomorrow night. Okay. And? And I know, and Spoon was there as well. Where's that? At uh, last Thursday for the, oh, yeah, the yeah, brief yeah. finance and the superintendent. All right. And I don't think the diversity committee has met. No, we'll meet next Wednesday. So there we are, check and those, that's fast. All right, then we're on to administrative reports. Jerry's not here, I had her go last time. Jeff's not here. So it's up for you guys, which would like to take it, Mark or Kelly. Mark? Okay. We're in your school. Sure. <laughs> We just met last week, um, so there's not a lot more to report on what we're 
we've been doing, but um, I'd like to focus on some things, upcoming events. Um, at the bottom of the report, under the uh, upcoming events section, I'd like to note a couple of opportunities um, for school board members to, to visit the school. Uh, tomorrow morning, we have a school sing. Um, school sing starts um, between 8.25 and 8.30 on Thursday mornings. Um, tomorrow morning, um, our sixth graders will be performing some rock songs um, with Miss A. So they'll be um, playing piano, playing electric guitar, playing the drums, playing um, cans, and also singing. So I heard them today um, performing during music class, and they were great, and they were really proud of themselves. So um, full-fledged rock concert for two songs <laughs> tomorrow morning. Um, that's an opportunity. And one I'd really like to highlight is our winter band and chorus concert, which is uh, December 12th at 6 o'clock. I believe that's next Wednesday. Um, I think that's going to be a really good show. If you can make it, that'd be great to see you there. Um, one of the things that Miss A, our music teacher, has brought to the school, one of the many things she's brought to the school, is a chorus. Um, over the years, we never had a chorus. And she started um, with a really small group a couple of years ago. Last year, it got a little bigger. Um, this year, we have a chorus of 40 students. And every Thursday morning at 11 o'clock, um, they're in here practicing. And the acoustics actually in this library are really good. It sounds amazing. Um, so I'm excited for the first time we're going to have a full-fledged chorus as part of our winter concert. I think that's going to be a highlight for sure. Um, and the nice thing about our chorus is we have multiple staff members who've been singing with the kids um, each week for practice. So. At six o'clock next Wednesday? Six, six o'clock next Wednesday. <clears throat> um, on the back side of the report, again, some things that are up and coming. Our school senators have been working with Project Feed the Thousands. Um, next Wednesday morning, they'll be on the morning show with Ian Kelly on WTSA talking about Project Feed and the work that they've been doing. Um, and just the concept of no matter how old you are, you can still be a leader and an agent of change, so change agent. Um, and then we have um, a literacy night with uh, children's author Suzanne Bloom. She'll be with us on Thursday night next week, December 13th. Um, we'll have serve pizza for families at 5.30, and then 6 to 7, um, Suzanne will be hosting a literacy night talking about storytelling. Um, the following day, she'll be working with our kindergarten through third graders um, in multiple workshops. Every kid will receive a free book to take home. Um, and then she'll be at the Brooks Memorial Library on Saturday, December 15th, for the entire community. Um, be putting on a, on a workshop. Um, so that'll be for, for anyone in the community to check out. Um, and then lastly, on December 18th, um, we will have a combination of the Career Center students and NECA students performing the Nutcracker for the school. Um, they did that last year, it was great. Um, this year they're adding an aerial component to the show, which is with NECA. So adding what? An aerial oh. perf performance. In the gym? In the gym, yeah. And then, um, last thing I want to point out, as a, a, at the very bottom, some noteworthy things. Um, in the fall, um, our librarian, Miss Shannon, um, had the students write spooky stories um, through the Vermont Spooky Saga book. And she <clears throat> turned all of those stories in um, to this publication. And she just got word um, two days ago that 39 of the stories that we entered are going to be published um, at a future uh, February publication. So the kids are pretty excited about that. And the neat thing was that students who were not chosen to be published 
received <coughs> feedback and notes from the editor mm -hmm. so that they could go back and make some changes to the story and possibly resubmit. So it's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, our SHAC committee, which is our school health committee, um, has applied for a grant and just um, heard yesterday has received that grant. So we'll be able to purchase a mobile kitchen cart um, that we can use in the school. So essentially, <clears throat> we can turn our classrooms into a kitchen. You wheel the cart in, um, do a lesson, and you can actually cook in the classroom. So we're really excited about that initiative. And then lastly, at our PTO meeting on Monday night, um, the PTO approved an artist in residency program with Judy Dow who's an Abenaki culture um, specialist, and she'll be working with us in April, K through six, for a full week. Um, so we're excited about that opportunity, and obviously I'll report out more information about that as we get closer. But I provided a description in the report. Great. That's it. <laughs> She's wonderful. I got to work with her as a teacher a few years ago. Nice. Yeah, she's done work in schools around the SU, and she is amazing. Yeah, I think she did a project with the Guilford yeah. kids last year. That was really neat. It was good. Yeah, that's what we've heard. So we're yeah. very excited. And the, was there funding that the PTO had raised for that? Is that the PTO is, is sponsoring that? Yeah. Just want to mention that I went to the PTO meeting the other night. And I also went to the Oak Grove PTO meeting, and then I'm going to go to Kelly. This is with my Brattleboro School Endowment hat on. But it, it was really nice to see the enthusiasm and the amount of parents at both Oak Grove and um, Green Street. And just really great ideas, and they're working hard on not just fundraising, which is really the goal of the parent group, is to be more of the what we're hoping to see in leadership councils. I mean, it seems like it's truly happening and the voice is coming back from the parents to the administration on all sorts of ideas. I wasn't there for very long, so maybe I'm, if you wanted to say anything else, I might have been Yeah, I, I think we're very lucky. We have, they're true leaders of our school. Um, and in fact, for our school spotlight presentation, um, I've asked some parents to, to speak on behalf of the school as well. So. That'll be part of the 19th Good. presentation. Okay. All right. Uh, in the month of November, we enrolled five new students and lost one. Um, we had a fire drill where the West Rat Fire Station came to join us. I talked about that last time. Um, looking ahead, we're thinking about our second round of after school programs and hoping to expand some offerings. We've got NAYT starting up for the three town schools in January, so we're taking enrollment for that. Um, and they've done a nice job. They're coming to the school and they're putting on a short workshop for each grade level that they're inviting, four through six, to really get some momentum going. So that's uh, pretty exciting since we don't have a theater production happening in our school this year through our own staff. Um, we're going to do printmaking again, and we have an, another new offering, which is a card collecting club. Anything from Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh or all the different cards that kids, um, it's starting up, started by a sixth grader. He has created the whole thing. He's making flyers, so um, we're hoping that that will catch on. We're going to also do an outdoor adventure club, which may or may not have snowshoes if we can get them and a chess club. Um, anything of note? Let me see. We had our project feed kick off on Tuesday at All School Sing. Kelly Corbiel came and our uh, student leadership group did a short skit to kick that off and they showed a video which was really moving and wonderful. Uh, we also have the Nutcracker coming on the 19th. I met um, one of the women who helps coordinate that today from NECA, and she was great. So we're excited about that. Tomorrow night, here's your invite, community night, 5.30 to 7. Jill knows. She's done her share of community nights. Um, there'll be activities in the gym, 
will be choosing a raffle basket winner and the Love Brigade table will be set up to make cards in the music room. And also tomorrow, in, during the school day, we have a workshop called Hour of Code that's being put on by Apple. And that's for our sixth graders. So that's happening at 9 o'clock and at 10, 10, 10.30. And I'm going to be there at 9 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> There's two sessions. The on? It's called Hour of Code. So Apple oh. brings a few, like, 20-something iPads, and they'll be teaching kids working in teams how to do basic coding, yeah. which looks cool. really cool. And I'm hoping that will catch on also to become maybe an after-school program. Um, so I know kids get really into that. We had a social media wellness workshop last Thursday. Uh, wasn't the best turnout that we had hoped for, but it was right after Thanksgiving break, and it was the first of four that we're going to do. So um, we had a great conversation about what we see at home with our kids and how we can sort of find a healthy balance in terms of technology usage and what's safe and what's appropriate for kids of this age. So um, there'll be another one in January and then February and March, I believe. So we'll let you know on those dates. What time does the community night thing start? 5.30. 5.30? Yep. I could come for 15 I know. <laughs> She's thinking the same thing. Okay. Let's go. I'm Kelly. It's been on the So I don't know too much less than our elementary school kids. Uh, what is code? Code is how you write websites or games. So HTML code is the, the thing that you don't see when you pull up any web page. It's like what they used to call computer programming. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Come by. It's pretty... I used to know like the basics of it and it was pretty fun, but I surpassed me now. I don't have time to do it. <laughs> I'm hoping to learn something tomorrow too. All right. And there's our winter sports breakdown below, but that's for the winter sports agenda item, so right. I'll just Perfect. leave that with you. All right. Well, so a couple, a few of these meetings in the past when we've talked about PTOs or um, leadership councils you've instructed um, principals to reach out to um, probably people of color, African Americans. I met with Michaela to, Michaela Sims, the diversity coordinator, to talk about that a little bit. Um, her suggestions to me, I thought, were really enlightening. First off, we should be reaching out to any marginalized population, um, not limiting it to just um, people of color. And the other thing she suggested was that, actually two things, that we're reaching out with something specific in mind, not will you join the PTFO, but the PTFO is going to be doing this, would you be interested in helping us? And then also ensuring that we're inviting people who would be um, welcoming to marginalized populations. So I thought those were both really interesting and good suggestions that we can consider as we move forward. Um, the other thing that I wanted to report out, it's only been a few days since we met, but as you know, on Friday at 46, our final orders were, um, were sent out um, regarding merger. Um, the State Board of Ed has uh, determined that Putney, Demerson, Broadboro, and Guilford uh, and BU number six should merge into one uh, union, unified union school district. Um, their Vernon is still to be determined, and in my conversations with the agency of ed, um, Donna Russo Savage, she had said it'll probably be January, February before they even take up the whole question of what happens um, with Vernon. So that's still to be determined. Um, but it's not possible for them to come in under us. We would have to retain our supervisory uh, union. Uh, and they've already decided that we can't. They haven't yet. She's, according to Donna, the, they've determined that we will merge. They have not determined that they will dissolve us as a supervisory union. It's two different things. And according to Donna Russo Savage, November 30th, they had to make the merger decision, but they did not have to make the decision on whether or not the supervisory union was dissolved. So they're saying it's possible that they could have the unified school district and then Vernon as members of WSESU. So it would be the unified school district, the supervisory union, and Vernon. And Three probably the high school board would stay. But I mean, 
Because if I they did, we'd only have we only do one district. I suspect, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I certainly will need. I was surprised they hadn't offered that yeah. or thought about that somewhere yeah. along the line. The only thing I could see is possibly the unified board would act as a supervisory board and have Vernon membership. That's yeah. the only alternative that I can see would happening. Um, otherwise, there would be three boards. But if so in that case you're saying if if vernon was allowed to remain part of wsesu then we would still need to have a separate board for wsesu Either that and for the school board a member from vernon and when the unified board was taking up business that involved uh, high school vernon student vernon specific then the vernon member would be a part of that Discussion and then that would allow Vernon to still have supervisory union services from us, yes. central office and all of that? Yes. Because I thought we'd had a reading from them that said no, that that was definitely not. So, well, previous, yeah, it was. Yeah. This yeah. is a new... This is all... If, well, the, yeah. the, the no is if we form a district, we can't have another district with us mm -hmm. that's different. different. Right. right. If we're one district, we just that's all we can do. But so that's if they found a two-district way or some maybe some other workaround. So the Articles of Agreement merge Putney, Dummerson, Brattleboro, Guilford, and BU6. They don't say anything about Vernon, and they don't say anything about whether or not we must retain our supervisory union status. And those are the things that still are to be determined. But they do say the rest of us cease to exist. It does say for you. It just no, says just BU6 exist. is part of the merged district. It doesn't say that these. It doesn't say anything um, ex ceases to exist. And uh, our organizational meeting warning it has. Does, it does. Sorry. It does say Article 13A on July 1st, when the new union district becomes fully operational, is solely responsible. The forming districts shall cease all educational operations. Correct. But that means Dummerston will no longer have their own individual board, Brattleboro will not, Putney will not, Guilford will not, BUHS BU, does not, BU6 will not. It doesn't say WSESU will not, mm. because WS, WSESU is not considered a forming district. The forming districts are the schools and towns. Towns are the schools. That's the way I'm reading it. Good one. It's really <laughs> open to interpretation, so that's why we're contracting with us. <laughs> anyway, our organizational meeting warning was approved by the uh, Secretary of Education and um, it will be January 9th, uh, 7 o'clock at uh, Broadway Union High School. And as part of the Articles of Agreement that everyone should have, um, there's an agenda listed and that agenda will be what we follow that meeting. And that's all all four towns population. Correct. It's the electric. Yeah, yeah. it's the electric. Yeah. January ninth. Yes. Would you go? I missed the. You missed. You uh, mentioned three things that Michaela suggested to oh. invite all the marg all marginalized people, mm -hmm. give them something specific to do, and what was the third? Thing? Invite people that would be welcoming to them. Uh, the high school gym. And that's the meeting that. Yes, that's the meeting that the board, Jill and the, the, Spoon. The two will of us, be, Spoon, have to be at January 9th. You want to put that on your calendar for yep. sure. And you'll six. be sworn in that night. Sworn in for. Uh, to be a member of the transitional board. Well, actually, if you read a little further down that article, the school districts can. Elect uh, like somebody people. else. Yeah, and I want, and I would yeah. encourage us when we get to that point yeah. to to talk about whether we want to make sure that or I, I would like us to make sure that whoever those two people are are people that are committed to running for the unit the unified board as well. When all of a sudden done, they're going to be there to implement the, the plans that they okay. develop. I would suggest we put that on the next meeting because there's okay. not a lot of time between now, now and the first mm -hmm. when you have to start yeah. getting them. And if you read through the articles, um, it spells out what the transitional board does. The main job is to 
pull the get pull together budgets that you will then present to the people that are on the newly elected board. That's it. So we want to put that on the agenda for next yes. week, next two yeah. weeks. Yeah. No, that's not a normal time for us to meet. It's the second Wednesday. Two yeah. from today? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, I'm sorry, that's about January 9th. January 9th? No. We tried to pick a day when no, but no board okay. would likely be meeting. So between now and next two, two weeks from now, all of us need to figure out if we are interested in running for the merged MUD or unified or whatever it ends up being board. Yes? Yes, that's going on the agenda for next time. And all of us should be soul searching because David's right. It'd be good if we had. Can somebody go over this uh, <clears throat> this whole pro <clears throat> process? So on on the ninth of January, where they're supposed to be establishing a transitional board, right? And they become effective when. That day. That, that day. day. So did you get it's what just was sent to carry out over from then until the election, election. of a new board right. in, in March? But did, so it's like but did you get thing. the uh, whole articles of agreement, the new ones that David had? Um, new ones? No, I still got the ones from a couple of years ago. Well, those were ours. These are the ones that were um, put in place for us by the State Board of Education. Uh -huh. Barb sent it out. Oh, yeah. I've well, sent I've sent Lyle just sent one today that two. was an updated one. Yeah. So, so it, it lays out today. every single step that uh, okay. has to be gone through. So you might want to read through that meticulously and then see if you understand and have more questions, which is likely because it's not exactly it's not like exactly clear. really, really clear. There's some things, but it. It does lay out how long the transitional board is, and that's where we were pointing out the transitional board is, according to the Articles of Agreement, um, pretty much mandated with the exclusion that, or the exception in there that we can, as a board of ourselves, change that. So by what's mandated, it's the clerk, that's you, and me, the chair. And David's suggesting that at our next meeting, we all have searched our souls and figured out whether we're going to run for this merged board because it would make a lot of sense to have the people on the transitional board continue on at least be running for and have some the experience. <laughs> I guess <laughs> it, uh, my question is uh, how long does this board, our board here, exist? Until July 1st. We yeah. cease to exist in March. Well, July, July, July 1st. Oh, July 1st. And this is all dependent on there not being an injunction. Okay, so yeah. uh, do we have to run in March or are we automatically continued until June 30th? No, you would have to run for the, the five for a, or six three month, month term. Yeah. The, okay, sorry, I misunderstood the question. The, the board, the Brattleboro Town School Board exists until July, but the people who terms expire, like you and me, we're one year and positions, I, our I'm terms end in March unless we're elected, and I don't think that we're going to be elected, or are we, yeah, we is have this to. board going to be elected again also? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in you March, would have to, have, would you have could to run for two boards, is that how it would be? You would have to, because this board needs to be um, together through June 30th. Okay. For any business that, and that you will sense. only be talking about business from this year, so for instance, 1% would come out of next year's budget, so that would be that other board. But anything that happens in the schools this year, any student discipline, any employee issues, anything like that will okay. come to this board. And then the largest issue of that is to just make sure everything is transferred <laughs> to the next. Approving the budget, yeah, it's important for you to approve a budget for Bradford Town. Okay. And then, so if in your case, your case and my case, we would need to take out um, the petition. petition in January, get our names, people's signatures, turn that in, just to remain on this board through the end of June. Or if you wanted to be on 
the merge board, then you'd have to get two petitions. Two petitions. And those petitions actually will be available at town clerks next week. And the transitional board will become the first no. permanent board, so no. there'll be yet more elections. The no. transitional yeah. board is not elected. Elections. It's just the no. people who are already on the school okay. boards that are trans that are carrying it over until an, an election happens. When do those elections occur? Does anybody know? There's no election for the transitional board. No, for the permanent merge board. The so, town meeting. Uh, town meeting. Uh, it might be before town meeting. We have now that we have just gotten the warning articles approved for the organizational meeting. Um, Barb and Frank and I have to count a certain number of days and a certain number of Mondays, um, and then we can set the election. It will probably be the end, the last week in February. But there will be two elections: one for the new board, one for this board. Why is it that it has to be two different elections? We were concerned that it would be too confusing for confusing citizens way. to have two separate ballots. Maybe people would say, I already voted on that ballot. Why do I have to do this ballot as well? But are you concerned that not many people will come and vote on the February election? It wasn't. Yeah. OK. <laughs> I, I would think of that as a potential drawback. So it no sounds like all, all at one time we're going to have this board, the transitional board, and the new SU board. The new SU board. All in place. Not the transitional and the new, new SU. Right. The, the new SU board will meet with the transitional board, but once the new SU board is in place, the transitional board will, after meeting to present budget and that type of thing, the transitional board will cease to exist. Could you make up a timeline for our I'm working the next on a timeline. Time. Oh, I will hope that it's done by next time. Yes. And then tomorrow night at the supervisory union meeting, there's a webinar on exactly this sort of thing. Maybe. That was scheduled, that was canceled this afternoon, that I just emailed and said, wait, because they put in the email webinar for today is canceled and then in the email it said webinar for tomorrow and so like which webinar is this and they said we really were looking at that as part of our supervisory union and it'd be good because we're all together and she said let me check something and she came back and she said I promise you I will try very very hard to get it so that at least just your supervisory union board can hear it tomorrow as a webinar so tomorrow hopefully you can see that if not for sure on Monday, the Vermont School Board Association has put together a webinar to answer exactly this sort of thing of what happens when and by whom. Yep. So that was Lyle's administrative report. Yes, it was. Okay then. We're on to unfinished business. Budget overview. Who's <coughs> first? Frank has spent the last two days in a workshop in Killington because in the midst of all this, we are required by state um, statute to set up new finance systems. And so he's been with a couple of other people from our finance office um, in Killington uh, building the new system. So uh, he is not available and good luck before the next meeting. He will be, I know. He's before tell me. Yeah. <laughs> he's met with Kelly. He's met with Mark. Mm -hmm. I don't know where Jerry stands in that, too. But. So that does remind me to tell you all here publicly, remember the letter we talked about last time that was in support of early education staying under our board's purview or the new board, whichever. But um, and I drafted that letter. We approved the letter, and we signed it, and I, um, we sent it off. And Deb happened to be with a fellow from the regional level that day and emailed me back and said he really feels like this letter will help a lot and they were very glad we wrote it. And that part of that letter was because of the financial systems change too is why we're asking for the advance of almost a million dollars to run that program because of changing when the year starts. So what do we know about the budget overview? What, who would like to tell us anything? Exciting, because Franz is here too. <laughs> well, I can tell you, if we look at B under unfinished business, that Frank is going to be putting in um, 
debt, got in touch with them. So putting in um, money for us to see how it impacts the budget so that we bring the lead teachers, the e, uh, EES lead teachers up to uh, the salary level of a teacher with a BA step four, I think is what we decided. So he'll be doing that, so that will be one of the things when we get the budget, um, we'll be in there, and we'll see how that impacts. One of the things we, just to remind you all, one of the things we mumbled about last week was perhaps doing it all in one year or perhaps phasing it in, whatever. So the idea is to set it in, in full mm -hmm. and then we can see where it is. It's perfect. Tomorrow, we, um, on the, the SU agenda, it's an action on the SU budget. Are we planning to vote to approve the SU budget? Yes. Yes. And is there still an additional administrative position to hand over to Cross Blue Shield? Yes. Okay, so that's the place to talk about that? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that, I think it's perfectly good to talk about that here. Yeah, because you've got... Because the representation of want to know that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, but the, I asked about that, and it was... A, Horrifying answer. Mm -hmm. What, the $3,000 for each mistake or something? Yeah. yeah. Per 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 person day. per day that's in, in play, right? I don't know. I can't remember the per day, but definitely. No, it was per day. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was per day. Per day. The, the tax yeah. penalties. That's fine. Yeah. I get, my question is why, I mean, we're in the education business, and why wouldn't we hire tax experts and contract with them rather than take on yet another employee and another set of benefits. And I'll ask this to Ronette to the, to the whole board, but it just seems like it's if the governor ever gets around to telling us what our ratios need to be, that's going to set us off. It's an extra twelve or $1,300 every year because they're going to be in a retirement system. And I mean, all the things that go with having an employee so that we can become tax experts, and it just seems like way beyond what we should be considering. You know, Richards can manage things like that. And I don't know if it's—I don't know if it's tax experts. It's just. Or, I'm sorry, not tax right. insurance yeah. experts. Well, in, yeah. and I don't know if it's so much insurance, but it's a lot of inputting, like computer work, and and so just. That, I think and that was why it wasn't the expertise; it was actual paper. Ma manually well, inputting. And again, everything. why would we not? Right. Them, why not? Why would we not hire professionals that do that? So that's you know that's good question. I, I don't know what Richards would get but, yeah. for something like that, but I'm sure that you know what are other SUs doing? How are the people handling? Is everybody hiring somebody else? Any thoughts on the White House tonight to share? <laughs> there have been no further conversations about the White House, which. This year has been lovingly referred to as Casablanca. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I know I haven't had a White any House makes people's minds go in another direction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything you would like to point out to us at this point? I guess um, you know one of our, the major things in our budget <clears throat> when we have a draft to look at is um, we're going to be looking at um, hopefully doing an energy efficient lighting project. Um, we've done a good job getting this building more and more efficient and I think the, the next phase for us would be to go to LED lighting. Um, and I think over time with a project like that we'll end up saving money quite a bit of money. Actually that's something again depending on what happens with the, the legal appeal and injunctions and stuff if this is going to go forward, we need. I would. I'm going to encourage us to look at our probably eight hundred thousand um, dollar surplus account and look at some energy. Pro like that would be a really smart thing to do in terms of using that money to reduce future expenses for the people in Brattleboro. And we've got a several hundred thousand dollars worth of projects already laid out and planned and spec for um, Oak Grove, including those glass blocks we've been talking about for forever. So that, and we and we just need to talk about. That. I think that's a good segue right into that. That was on my personal agenda to, to look at that and to see what the will of this board is. We, I think, come in with the largest surplus by far into this merger. Yes. Unless the well, we UHS. Well, we lost the last year, thanks to the governor. Yeah. But BUHS doesn't have any surplus, or do they? Oh, yes. They do. They do. So they have a million and a half less than they had last year. Yeah. yeah. But so they I have a, still, a they significant have. one. But otherwise, in comparison to the other elementary boards, we have much more. Mm -hmm. So it, it does say clearly in the Articles of Agreement that we can 
tag those, earmark those some way. Um, so I'd like us to know as we go forward here what those projects would be, like David's suggesting if, if that would be one. Um, I think we should also look at our capital plan and make sure that we have all of those listed in the capital plan to ensure that that's a place where it makes the most sense with the projects that we've just mentioned. And Going okay. back to the topic of the White House for a second, um, okay, from watching the video of the last meeting, it seemed like people were talking about um, whether somehow moving around students would reduce the need for an outbuilding there at Academy. But I'm just wondering, as we've heard about the current situation, I think I've heard that the special ed didn't have a private space to work or the social worker. And I'm just wondering if there's any liability there of like, are we violating people's right to privacy by continuing in these like makeshift places? Because I feel like that might make a building more urgent than it would seem if we're just looking at like, well, she has to have a classroom that's in a closet for the enrichment students or whatever. Well, David had a good idea too of borrowing space from the church, which would make it even mm -hmm. more private because it's, it, or coming into some sort of an agreement, it's right next door. Okay. Yeah, yeah we've got a rooms. daycare park, at least for a okay, the daycare park. Okay, just back to the daycare park. I thought they were talking about a church. Big house, whatever, too. One where we had the uh, principal meeting. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> where Westby is. I'm yes. familiar with that church. <laughs> Another point that, that Kelly made last week about the White House is that we're not creating new space. We're trying to replace space. Right. And the White House is getting, well, it's well beyond its life expectancy at this point. So, But there was some talk of when, when rebuilding on that spot to make something with more capacity than the current building has. Yeah. Right. And I think we were not thinking so much building there, but sort of at the end of where the kindergarten is now. Okay. But would we be replacing the number of square feet in classrooms, or would we be adding more than is currently existing? And that's one of the things when we met, we talked with, we actually were texting Ricky to find out what the square, okay. <laughs> what's the square footage of the White House. None of us really knew. Um, I thought the White House that's there now had a pad put down. It has to be. So, yeah. building it in another, I thought that was part of the whole deal of how it was not going to be so high priced. But I remember a price tag of like 800000 am I wrong? Because that, that comes out to a really high number per square feet mm -hmm. of that building. Mm -hmm. Especially if there's already a pad and power mm -hmm. and That's water. True. True. So, moving that location, I don't think behooves us. But I, I'm still having a I go on record 5,000 times. I am having a hard time with uh, Casablanca, White House, whatever it is, coming back in there. But what would you, I mean, the, the space that is needed now is more than there is. So how does it make sense to just remove a building, even if they could do something in that church basement or wherever? I, I'm, I mean, most of the school day, their classroom space is already used by the nursery school, so there's rooms in the basement, like where we have those interviews. But it's they're really small. I mean, depending on what type of needs you were hoping to meet in the White House, I don't think you could just transfer what goes on there into that basement. Some things you could, like having a meeting, a private meeting, or working with a one-on-one -on -one or a small number of students. Yes, but if it's meant to be like a classroom space or I don't know exactly what happens in here. And I think we need to see exactly what's going on in the White House that can't happen someplace else that's already in existence at Academy. I'm thinking about just travel time too with kids. So usually right. it's a 30 minute block and to get small children Walking. out of the building across the street into the church and settled for a roof with materials would probably take at least 10 minutes minimum. And there's some safety concerns too, I think. So if we do that side of the building, so, still though, the population has gone down, and so our class numbers, students in each class, the love level is down. We're actually up to 358, which is the highest we've been in at least a couple of years, which is good. 
Um, one thing we talked about too, going back to the privacy question, Robin was um, putting up walls similar to what Mark did up here. Um, he created some really nice workspaces for special ed, academic support, um, doing that in our resource room so that it would be partitions instead of an open room with just shorter walls. Yeah. And that would solve some of the privacy problems for special ed at perhaps a smaller cost. I don't know what the construction would be and what we'd have to do to vent for air and things like that, but that could be an option. And then just literally replacing White House space with the exact same space. Mm -hmm. um, so for, for I, I don't want to be mm -hmm. negative nor condescending in any way. But for me to be able to justify this in my mind, I need to see the numbers and why we can't adjust around and find space. I, I feel like between the three schools in Brattleboro, if we're down in population. Can we look at that actually, of like what the student numbers at these three schools are over the last five years? Because I keep hearing that is a trend, but it doesn't seem like at least at Green Street and Academy, I mean, when we look at like the number of kids in the classrooms, most of them are fairly decent sized classes. It's not like you see at some of the outlying schools where they have like a grade with 12 people in it or something. Or six or seven. Right, I mean, there are like 18 people in a class most of what I'm seeing, isn't that about right, you guys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it doesn't sound yeah. to me like our schools are having that right. I think much it's, of a decrease in numbers. It's a decrease from say 20 or 21 down to 15 is probably the smallest class. But most of them are above 15 even. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard to talk about without the numbers yeah. in front of us. I, I would like to see yeah. the numbers uh, enrolled for each grade if we could just look at that for like the last five years and see is it truly going down here like it is everywhere else. And I also saw an article yesterday now this didn't have to talk about Brattleboro, it's just Vermont as a whole, but it said that there is actually, despite the law, a pre-K shortage and that people are having trouble finding spots. And I was wondering if that is relevant here because that was one of the other things that was considered for the White House was when we replace this, could we add a space that could become a pre-K classroom? And then it seemed like we were kind of like, ah, we don't need to, the needs are met by the other schools, but I'm just wondering, since I read the article, if, if we are meeting everyone's needs. Before we go to that, could we stay with the, the class numbers just for a minute? Because I, I wanted to say something. Okay. I, didn't wanna, I don't want to interrupt anybody. No, go ahead. The, um, we have six sections at each grade level, right? One that will grow two here and three. And so if we have more than 120 kids, we need all six sections. So that would, so we would have to replace those spaces, because those are classroom spaces. We've got to get 20, 20 or approximately 18 or 20 kids in there. If we're looking at a, a hundred or a hundred and three or something like that in, in some of those grades, then we could combine. Yeah. And but the kids. White House isn't well, a classroom, well, I, I, is it? I, I want to finish the thought, if I can. The, um, so that's just us. If we merge, we are surrounded with four towns that have excess space. And it would be very difficult to get a merge board to say, yeah, we're going to build some more in Brattleboro when we have excess space in these other towns. And they're going to be, and the state has said it's okay to bus kids as far as Guilford in the cold and snowy. Well, so it, it's the not going to be. The state says it's okay to bus, but I mean, it's not like Guilford's the end of the earth. No, it's not. <laughs> it's just a winding, dark road in the, in the winter. But, yeah. So we're going to have to look at all of those options before we look at spending money on new construction. But the White House is not a classroom, is it? No, no small it's workspaces. Mm -hmm. I thought but I think it was two, it was two classrooms. No, there's actually five, five AST offices, and oh, then see, our so social worker agree. has a phone. Mm -hmm. well, we kept so it's more like the supporting the space. How long ago was that? This is scary. You're going to go tiptoeing through the school again. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't go out there. But I was out there because Molly was in the playground. Something else in relation I'm in the to school all the time, and I don't really know what's going on in there, so <laughs> it's not necessarily a failure of, of not being there. It's just when you think about the student enrollment, one thing that's really important to remember is the transiency that we all see. So we've got five kids in this month. We might see three or four go out next month. You know, it's it's constant. You guys know that we talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. But that calls for an increase in our academic support, mm -hmm. which we talked about in our case studies, and um, you'll probably hear from Mark this month. 
but more and more kids need to be pulled out for what we call that tier two intervention time in order to close the gaps because they're coming in at whatever grade level they're at, sometimes at a kindergarten grade level when they're actually in fourth or fifth grade. And our academic support team has to work tirelessly in small groups, interventions all day in those spaces. And those cannot be done in the classroom. It's too many kids, it's too stimulating, it's too distracting. So that's really why that space is so important for our purposes. Yeah, I think it's important <laughs> to remember that the, the need for space is not dictated primarily by student population, it's dictated by student need. And the needs of our population is changing. Right, so we, we now have to have a school social worker who needs a confidential space. Mm -hmm. Our special education departments are serving students at record levels uh, for our area. Right, so they're being taxed for their space. And so it's not the number of students that dictate that. It's the amount of services that we have to provide students. But if our, if our class exactly. numbers were truly decreasing, then maybe we could see, oh, this is heading to a place where we might only need two fourth grades, or we could have a combined fourth, fifth, and then the extra classroom could fill this need. So that's why I think it, it makes sense to look at that and see, are we going to end up with extra classrooms that we could use this as, or are we not going in that direction? And it's a move, like Kelly was saying, it's a moving number as well. Right. If you I mean, see we've had on report the big booklet you got, it lists for the last 20 years or more the number of students in the whole district all down okay. right yeah, up to we'll last year. Measured every October for the last time in the coming years. The other thing, Robin, I just, I think this was one of the questions that you asked. Um, according to Janice Stockman, who oversees sort of pre-school, mm -hmm. pre-K, we had three students last year who did not attend a preschool of some sort. Okay. So what I don't know is if, if that was by choice or um, if it was something to do with the expense of the cost of pre -school. Yeah. Well, I'd be interested to know, too, and this is maybe something Deb could let us know, but... Um, are they? Okay. That's the census data for Brattleboro Town School. But it doesn't give what we're still asking about, which is the numbers per classroom. Okay. Well, we provided that a couple of reports ago, right? Yeah, but for one year. Sure. She's looking to see what the trend is over yep. the last few years. Yeah, I mean, this does, so it, it kind of overall is going down clearly by this picture. Yeah, there's no question that's going down in the aggregate. Yeah. That, that's that's clear, but what's not clear is what you were asking about what the exact number of homes, and it's obviously what you're saying is true, and I'm still, I'm not trying to discredit that. One more thing about that, that in, in thinking about it that way, because that's exactly why our budgets continue to grow even though we have fewer kids, is it might be a helpful graphic might be the number of, and again, over 20 years, the number of kids, the numbers, the percentage of our students who are receiving additional, you know, mandated to receive, you know, that we have to provide additional services to. I don't know all the different, I don't mean people that enroll in there that come in after school for tutoring or, or um, you know, the enrichment that goes on anyway, or the interventions that go on anyway, but the actual qualified for programs that, uh, right. that, that have, have to, to provide. receive something. Yeah, what is that percentage? Cause That's a good question. Might, yeah, it seems to be up everywhere. And yeah. it'd be interesting to see the, the pattern because it might just follow our mm -hmm. staffing numbers, which would Could be a sense. good graphic to, yeah. to show people. And, you know, we, one of the most startling uh, pieces of data that Kelly provided a few weeks ago was just the number of toileting assists mm -hmm. in a very short amount of time. I provided it again today and it shocked me again. Yeah. It yeah. was here. So and this is 14 school days. 56 toileting assists to oh. academy school in 14 days. Because I was going to say, your number of nurse visits is in half, but that's because it was only half a month. Right. Okay. She I was like, boy, the new me. person's helping so much. She added as a note that I didn't put on here, she's uh, not counting all of the time spent helping kids find some two mittens and hats mm -hmm. to go out that come to school with nothing, uh, which she does a lot. So. The thing I was going to say we could maybe ask Deb about is, I know that it's mostly income eligible to go to EES, but that they have some people apply that are over income and they find a spot. I was just wondering like, how many 
how often is it that they turn people away that, that want to come to have free pre-K full-time and are told, no, you don't meet the guidelines, sorry. She seemed to indicate recently that they aren't um, Because they had, they had, they had, they had openings and everything, so. Okay. But it would be good to ask her again when she's yeah. here so she I don't know if there's like guidelines about we're only allowed to take two over income, so we had to turn those people it's, away even though we have an empty spot, or I don't know how it works. Yeah, no, I think everything's based on a point system, it, okay. you know, and if, you know, if, if you're homeless, you get a certain number, you know, it's, you get points, and that's how they, a lot of times, how they determine. So it's a point system that yeah. just is extraordinary. Yes. Okay. Yes. But I mean, even if the person didn't have the right number of points, and obviously if there's they a were, spot. Right. Yes. Okay. okay. I think yeah. John spoke really well to the need, and that's really mm -hmm. accurate. Mm -hmm. And I think another piece of information that'll be helpful is um, the January 2nd meeting, I believe, where we look at kindergarten readiness right. data mm -hmm. because I think that yes. gives a pretty yeah. um, clear picture of um, another way to look at need mm -hmm. and what we're seeing consistently. Another way to look at population also would be to just look at the kindergarten numbers because if we're seeing drops because of there was like a, a fall in population and then it starts going up again, we might not see the overall number enrolled mm -hmm. going up, but if, if our lower grades are fuller than the upper, then that could be a clue that the, the school is not going to get empty classrooms anytime soon. Lyle, on the, our preschool uh, partners, we still have the same number of preschool partners that we've had. Have we lost any or gained any? I don't know the answer But that would be a good indicator. If, um, if we have the same amount, then we still have the same. Well, it's not completely so, a good indicator because some of them got that star rating thing that we had to change up because it became more strenuous or rigorous. Right, but if we still have, if, if we've had 15 providers and we still have, yeah, I can find that. We're not losing as many spots, which is what Robin was talking about. Right. So there we go. More fun things to look at. Speaking of which, in, you pointed out on January 2nd, we have administrative reports, social workers helping families and individuals become independent. And you mm -hmm. wanted me to move that because the social workers are going to be covered in your individual things, right? So it's just kindergarten readiness and take off social worker reports. So that will be how? The social worker reports were going to be embedded within each school. About how, okay, about the independent, specifically the, the work in helping the families become independent. We'll hear from that. We did hear it, I think, in Academy already in that report. Okay. So, yeah. okay. so I'm going to send this out to you all again. Why don't you wait until the this end is of the, the night? the fifth okay. one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just, just hold up. Did, um, did we put a surplus, a conversation about surplus? Anyway? I put it on for the next agenda, so. So you could ask Frank how much it is? Yeah, yeah. I'll okay. move with Frank before. Yeah. He'll, he'll want to know. He will. So look at this. Not, it's not called surplus. What's it called? Fund balance. Fund balance. Fund balance. Right. That's what he knows. And... The other one we wanted to do was representation yeah. of Brattleboro on transitional board. Now, question for you, Lyle. If, if we do have this merger, we have the Brattleboro School Endowment, will that cease to exist? No, no, we'll okay. okay. No, no, that's that's not a very seat. clear question. There's two endowments. There's a, the one that's called the Brattleboro School Endowment mm -hmm. has nothing to do with the school board. Okay. It's completely private. doesn't matter where anything okay. goes. And Putney and Dumberston also have that. However, okay. there's also money, and I did want to talk about that one. There's money that's sitting. And when we need to have Frank look at that and tell us more. There's Didn't money we have that's a vote that he was going to pursue um, getting a manager for that? Yes, like but when we merge, what happens to that money? I assume because in the, so that was the one where I read through the wills of those mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And because it states specifically Brattleboro uh, students for, actually one is for girls sports, mm -hmm. one is for science and technical science, it wasn't technology, mm -hmm. science and math. Um, it stays with that. For instance, the high school has many endowments and it, it, they stay with the high school. Dummerston has their own. It stays with Dummerston. Okay. 
that type of thing, in my reading of this, that type of thing stays with the individual space. Okay, perfect. So, wanted to know. I want to push that one more time, sorry. Because if it's written, if it's something, a gift that's given that says specifically, okay, it goes to a Brattleboro child who's blonde haired and exceeds at pole jumping, then it's very clear in what the intent was. And I followed all of that. But then the last part you said was the Dummerston Endowment. So Dummerston has their own. Actually, I think this year they rolled it in to their budget, but Dummerston have their own endowment. I assume Putney does. Putney has money specified for their playground that was raised for many years. Um, that would stay in Putney for the playground. So that's a different thing to me because that falls under the earmarks, in the like our surplus funds. If we say $200,000 of the fund balance is marked to go to build a quarter of a White House. So then that's where it goes. It should. But you asked me to send that to an attorney and I did that okay. today. So and because the other thing you just said too is, is actually, in my understanding, illegal. If Dummerston took an endowment fund that people gave to and put that into their school budget, that was ruled illegal by Act 60. When we established the Brattleboro Town School or Brattleboro School Endowment, we were really careful of that because at any point, any town that was a gold town and ended up losing their money, that was their first inclination, was well then we'll just give money as little in taxes as we have to, and that can go up to the state and come back to us, whatever, but we still want X, Y, Z, we'll raise those funds independently in an endowment and then we'll fund them for the school. And the, the ruling on that was no, that's circumventing the whole purpose of the law. You can't raise private funds and use it to support what's in your public school budget. Well, we don't know what the, we don't know the, the details of this endowment are. Well, you said you rolled it into the budget. And it was specific to one particular, it could have been, we're putting this in for winter sports or we're putting this in for. Right, from, and my understanding of that is if, it, if winter sports, for example, is in their budget, they can't do that. That's what I'm saying. You can't take private yeah, funds. I understand and put what you're saying, budget. but what I'm saying is, I don't know the details enough. Mm -hmm. I'm just using winter sports as an example. Mm -hmm. They had something specific that the endowment in their endowment write-up said you can use it for this. They used it this year. The endowment was small. They used it this year. I mean, it's not if it's small anyway. It's not like it's going to rise to that occasion. Yeah, but it's like a thousand dollars. Right. Ours was. Our endowment that we've talked about having invested is not that small. It's like yeah. hundred or two hundred and seventy thousand dollars. I mean it sounds like what the outcome would be is that that money would then be managed by the merged board but with the direction that it could only be spent on things for that specific like designation of Rattleboro right. science or whatever. Right. Because we've are. talked here about the endowment being used for um, bringing in a science, the science guy or whatever. Um, I, I, we need to get our attorneys read on that, but it doesn't seem like that would change. So we jumped off the budget things into others. Is there anything else under the budget? Franz, do you have any questions as long as you're here and came to our lovely meeting? Yes, sir. Well, I. Tell me if I'm wrong. I, I was thinking that on January 2nd, the, there's going to be the public meeting to present the budget and then act on the budget, maybe at a board meeting following that. Is that the plan? January or is 2nd. there something different from January that? I'm looking for Here we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. First um, draft is supposed to be presented at 12, 12. We don't have a meeting until 12. Okay? Correct. We have our next meeting on the 19th. So that should be on 19. So we think it looks like the 12 19 was what should have been written on here, that we would be looking at it next meeting for the Instead first meeting. And that could be the previous one, Mile. 
I just grabbed whatever. That's a, what yeah, I have that's, in notes here. The 19th. Yeah. That's what it says on this calendar. <coughs> and then approved on the second. Yeah. So it would be the, the meeting on the 19th. You'll actually go over the numbers in some detail, and then on the second, see if you want to approve the proposal. Okay. And no, when would a plan. draft copy actually be available for people to look at? Uh, before the 19th. I don't know when. Frank can maybe let you know. Okay. Can I request, Jill, that the Green Street presentation starts that meeting? <laughs> on January 2nd? Uh, on the 19th. On the 19th. We have uh, between about 15 to 20 people coming to present. So that, that's fine. Yeah, let's do that. But I'm also thinking that the, for this first reading of the budget, how do we all want to look at that? What, so I'll just say what I'm thinking, and you can all say maybe you, you look at things differently. For me to look through pages upon pages of the budget, I don't care. I, I really want to see what's, what's new and what's been erased or what, what impacts it, really. I'm assuming when I look at your budgets every year that it's the same thing, largely, with the certain levels that have to go up for whatever, the paper costs slightly more, that the salaries went up slightly more. So I don't need to look at a whole lot of things except for those what's new, what's, which I know Frank largely does, but we often look at, you know, like what's off, offset here and what's offset there. And my head spins a little bit, but I'm not the numbers lover in the group. So the rest of you, how would you like to look at that budget? I mean, could it? I'd like to have the, the draft as soon as possible in advance of that meeting and um, with at least the two years previous numbers in the same format. Which and, is um, usually included in the What's that? It's that usually, usually one number. Yeah, that's usually the cause of it. Yeah, because I do, I like to go through But it's only one year usually, isn't it? It's only what? One year, not two. You're asking for two? They're usually, they're usually yeah. two years. Yeah, because yeah, like this year, because it'll have F-18, the F-19, and then F-20 proposed. Oh, yeah. So, and I go yeah. and I yeah. and I go through it all. Yes, and I count on that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> to be very honest, because that I mean we all get our roles on the board, but I know you look at them yeah. meticulously. And I'm more of a bottom line. Yeah, I mean, and it's easy, oh, it's easier if I see what the principals have requested because if there's a whole bunch of technology in there, a whole bunch of art or a new position, then I don't even have to wonder why is this number different. Mm -hmm. I, know. I know it's probably impossible, but it would be fabulous to get it like that Friday before, because then we have the whole weekend. Yeah, then we could blow it. the weekend I instead know. of just every week. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's this... a really short uh, short time. We used, to, it, we used to go into the central office and sit down and get it presented, and then we would make suggestions. and and what needed to change and what we wanted for the number and then the administration would kind of a week later they come back with another one. I think because of the way the, the way the information comes to us now, that's just not possible. We don't have the information to start any sooner. And is this next budget under a different chart of accounts? Is that part of what he's doing right now? It will be exactly the same as what you're looking at, what you've looked at in the past right now. Um, if that changes... So we should be able to compare. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, and then, then we can what, what, see if, if Frank can give us highlights of yeah. what he right. sees as big changes, right. like the $800,000 for the White House or the big bump for the EES people, and then if the principals have anything that they're like, we're doing a new thing, then just like mention that at the meeting as well. So how much time was Green Street planning on meeting? Probably 60 to 70 minutes. We can hold to about 60 because I think it's going to take at least 30 on the budget, even if we rush it. Yeah. And, and we, we just rush. added, well, the surplus is actually part of that, but, well, we can, I mean, we can talk for a long time. <laughs> I, I think that's, you know, this is really the, we also have to, like we wrote down about uh, potentially electing the transition board, too. Right. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's the, re I mean, we put that in there and didn't put other things there so that we could get a really full report and we can ask for Right, we wanted the full report. That's why I'm wondering. I think if we, we want to have, <laughs> if we want to have less time on other, if, if we want the meeting done at seven, we have to stop talking so much. I don't know how else to say it. 
or we just recognize that we can't do it in two, two, well, that's kind two of hours right. the way we could 15 I, years I think ago. we need to realize that it will not be a two hour meeting, most likely. Yeah. And, and, just, guys and, can, and you can go home and say. Uh, but. Well, they're going to want to be a part of the budget. Yeah, they, they're going to. Really want to. Yeah. <laughs> well, if we have questions. <laughs> No, I didn't mean for the no, budget, yeah. but for other things. Yeah. You know, they can leave for the transition board, right, transition board discussion. But I don't want to shortchange Green Street. That's what I, if I didn't get make that clear, that was what I was trying to say. Well, that, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, yeah. great. Thanks. So, okay. So, Franz, if you want like to hear the whole Green Street presentation, come at 5. But it sounds like we probably won't get to the budget portion until at least 6.30. Six, six, but it also has to have some time to for questions and stuff. Can people be here more? Four forty-five on a Wednesday, December nineteenth. Try. I can, and it would be really. I mean, it would be easier for the teachers. They, could, easier, they would love it, probably. <laughs> I can get here if we need to. What what time can you all get here? Because if we started with the teachers more towards four thirty, even. Um, that's probably going to be problematic. <clears throat> we had our after school programming. So the bus doesn't literally get here until four thirty ish. So our so what time hour, works for you all? I mean, I think five is probably the best five. to okay. still have this space set up appropriately. Mm -hmm. What a day! Teach all day to the after school program. They couldn't teach us. Right. <laughs> So I need some time to take a breath. But they just love <laughs> to be here and never want to leave, right? <laughs> <laughs> just like us. All right, moving on from budget. Yes? Before, well, it's kind of, it's new business, but it's kind of on the budget. The next one is winter sports. Or did I skip something out of nope. this one? So winter sports, we wanted to hear from you folks. I know Jerry had mumbled maybe this is time to put this into the budget. So it does have some direct link here what would you like to tell us about Kelly you had some uh, well most uh, of note is that now snow the cost of mountain snow has increased this year um, and we didn't find out about that increase until really recently so that wasn't planned for and typically increase by double reason. or not double or even a little more <coughs> Um, and it depends on if kids need the rentals or not. Um, it differs a little bit by kid when they go, but ultimately it's more than we are used to. Um, and we've shopped around a little bit, looked at other mountains, um, that we did not find anything else that would really work either travel-wise or um, just in general. Mount Snow is a great fit. We want to support our local mountain. But, um, that's been a big increase. So some of the fundraising that we do goes right toward it this year, like the butter braids that we just finished, that will go right toward Mount Snow and other winter sports. Other things like the raffle basket, you know, one year you do it, the next year it funds. So you obviously don't want to be at zero when you're fundraising ever. You guys know that. Um, but we're having to draw money from other places this year to pay for winter sports that we don't typically use. So some of the field trip accounts for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade have been tapped into. Um, and that's money that is in the budget. That is, yeah. Um, and the breakdown is we actually cut the Sobo Dance Studio off because the cost didn't, um, it wasn't really super costly, but there wasn't a high enrollment, and we felt like, you know, we've got to really consolidate where we're putting our money to make it work. <clears throat> and what we're dreaming of is what Green and Oak have been able to do is to take the whole school um, and do winter sports. So from Academy's perspective, <laughs> we were able to put some money in the budget toward winter sports, we could potentially take everybody to do some type of winter sports and or keep some kids on campus and go out and do winter sports on our grounds. I mean, that seems almost free. Why don't they, why don't you do that now with just having people go out in the forest or whatever? 
<laughs> and we a lot of people do it would just be more structured. Okay. It would be like everyone at the same on the same day okay. at the same time and, and it, it wasn't involved. it wasn't free when I was doing it and it's not at I don't at least Oak Grove and I think Green Street too because they call in meek and they Mm -hmm. had a coordinator right, that was right. actually leading it, so That's true. It w there was an expense to it. Um, but. Mm -hmm. And are you going, the Mount Snow price is six weeks, Correct. no matter what. If you use yes. two or six, you pay for six. I don't so, know. That I mean, was the other yeah, difference. Last too. year, we were told that as well, although we were only charged for five. Um, so this year we heard that, I haven't received a very clear answer okay. from Mass Snow, whether we would get charged for six or five, which we're planning on attending. But I do know for certain that the actual cost of, the, of going to Mass Snow is about doubled. What we were told is they have a new system and that we have to be pay for six regardless because we typically do four dates. So since we were doing six, we have to commit to paying for six. We thought, well, well, we'll then plan for six because we want to get our money's worth and have the kids ski. Therefore, we also had to increase the other winter sports places to six days. Mm -hmm. So that made the whole cost go up and our bus costs are up from last year as well. Kelly, I haven't heard a number yet. I, the I breakdown's right it's on, on the report. back of the other. Report. Oh, sorry, but I think it's yep. No, the other one. It's a little disconcerting that we really want to support our local mountain, and yet it was very late. It was Thanksgiving it time yeah. Yeah. that they let us know of the. It always is because that person interest. isn't even there until the beginning of November. So it, when you coordinate this, speaking from experience, it's a pain in the hand because. Mm -hmm. They don't tell you until that person's back. So it's like not November 1st, it's more towards the 15th, and then you have to have everything into them within days. And you have to turn around and get it all to the parents and get it all back. I think but what's frustrating for PTOs is, um, you know, they put a ton of energy and effort into raising funds for these enrichment activities. And then half of those funds go towards transportation. But we're really, you know, funding it for the experience, which you got to get from point A to point B. But your and parents drive from Mount Snow as well, right? We do. But so I'm talking about, I'm also them. talking about field trips. Um, and we use the bus in town to go to lo local places for winter sports. And um, so there's, I think there's a general frustration among the PTOs about that. I mean, this one has the buses not it's only about twenty percent of the cost of the whole thing. For academy especially. Yeah, for Academy. When I did this and I analyzed Mount Snow actually came out as the cheapest activity because we eliminated the bus. The bus there were enough parents who wanted to ski with their kids that the chaperoning took care of driving and so then Mount Snow's activity came out cheaper than say going to the rink because we had to pay for the bus to get to the rink. Well this one has 41 kids going to the rink for $600 and 48 kids going to Mount Snow for $6,000. Yeah. Okay, and the bus is only 1900 We allow the rec department to use the gyms in the schools. We send our children to that skating rink and we have to pay for it. Why is there not give and take? I've asked that question in the past as a parent as well, and the answer comes back something like the, the ice rink has expense to it, in that although we could ask the select board men. We certainly could. <laughs> it's so yeah, great. You can't ask me because I'm not the whole board, but I would certainly support it. Or else I'd probably have to. Would you take that question to them and ask? No, you'd have to. I mean, because <laughs> they'll just say, well, we're doing our budget right now, and it, it won't be in the budget, but. No, it would have to be a formal uh, formal request from the board or just an inquiry from the board. But that has been the answer in the past. That it, you know, if you go to the park, like to sled, there's no charge because there's nobody watching it or whatever. But the ice requires the 
Not so the heat, the Zamboni and the whole structure. And, and, and the skate rentals. Yeah. Well, well they have to keep really the ice good. frozen even if it is cold. Right. It's stay and so there's the infrastructure cost. And I think the high school pays the rec department for their, I know they do, because the hockey departments, all, hockey groups are always raising money. Oh, they, but they if, pay if the, the practice rec space. department, I didn't realize they did that, but the rec department has like basketball games or something like that in the school gyms? Yes. Yeah. Well, then and we, they, don't we have like, we're keeping the electricity right. lights we going and the custodians need to the court after. Yeah. There's some maintenance cost on our end as well with that. But that question goes even funnier to me when you look at where we hold our town meeting. Because I asked, why are we not holding in the high school anymore? And the answer because the high school charges, but the middle school doesn't. So we go to the middle school. I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense to me either. Anyway, and, and Academy doesn't charge when the town meeting reps come and do meetings there. We don't charge that. So there's like odd things that get charged and don't get charged. And I don't know if there's a pattern to it. I certainly can't explain it, but it's definitely worth an inquiry. Well, it does I, seem though like that is the cheapest <coughs> option I'm seeing on here. Uh, okay. The Boys and Girls Club, but maybe it's about, it's comparable. But if you're looking at like the per student cost, I looked at per the skating and sledding yeah. thing is not close to being the most expensive one. And we're still waiting on a few permission slips back, and there comes a point right about now where anyone who's late getting their uh, materials in, it it's automatically goes to the park. <laughs> so that yes. number might go up a little bit. But. Exactly what happens on the Mount Snow expedition? Does that occur over? Over how many times? A, a six week period? Yep, six so times. So 48 kids go up six times. They go, they leave school at like 10 30, 11 o'clock in the morning. They drive up, eat lunch in the car, they get out and they can have a little bit of free time. Then they go to a lesson for an hour. Then they ski for an hour or two on the road and then they are driven back home. So, it, and really, truly, six weeks as a chaperone of it. The first week they fall down and have no idea what they're doing. The second week they gain a little bit. Um, by the third week they're somewhat confident. By the sixth week they're stellar in a lot of cases and, the, and the, what they have learned and how they blossom is incredible. It really, the six weeks is, Mount Snow is right, it's a great amount of time. When we've taken an academy only four times, the kid leaves still pretty unsure and doesn't really have a great feeling for it. But, Moving back to the budget part, do we, I kind of feel like you guys should bring the budget of, with all, everything that you think makes life better without the dream budget. Yeah, with the knowledge that we'll laugh at you, but you know, <laughs> yeah. we'll be cool. or Jill will laugh. <laughs> Jill will laugh. <laughs> but I mean, like, what is it, what makes more sense? I think as a parent who's fund fundraised for this for forever and ever and ever, it's, valid to have parental input and get that buy in and it's valid for the kids to do something like that too but it's also when it comes to the point that your all of your parental time is spent on one activity then i don't think it's right anymore i also think it's unfortunate that you had to draw money from the field trips because that impacts you know the re everything it's some yeah, there's a lot of really cool things that could be done with the field trips mm -hmm. that are now just going to fund this. And at Academy, it's only benefiting less than half the school. So things that could have maybe been gone on with the second graders, now they can't do because the fourth graders went skiing. No, they're only taking fourth, fifth, and fourth sixth, sixth, sixth fundraising, or field trip. Oh, Each grade has their own field okay. trip account. But still, that limits what those fourth and sixth, and sixth graders are able to do with the rest of the year. Kelly, the, the, you mentioned limiting the dance program, and I'm not sure exactly how to phrase the question, but what kinds of, is there a particular kind of kid that, show, I mean, it seems like people who want to go to the dance program are probably like the people who want to go to the circus program. That's something that they think they're going to be good at or they really want to do. And um, I'm just wondering why, um, is, it, is what are they going to do, you know, what's the alternative, is that something that's really... Yeah, I think that there really weren't that many kids interested in going to dance for whatever reason, which I was surprised by. I thought it sounded really great, but... Oh, so it's not, it's not um, the... 
yeah, a bunch of kids who really loved that. And they yeah, all okay. no, so it made, that was what the one that made the most sense to cut. And it ended up saving us six hundred dollars. Why can't the kids ski at Memorial Park? Talked about that too. Oh, yeah. That's what I did as a kid. Ever, ever, ever. Um, when I was a kid, we had people there that gave lessons, and there was an opportunity to rent equipment at the park, and the Bye. T bar was running. Bye. But there's nothing. So, in order for that to happen, we would have to get those things in place someone to instruct, someone to bring equipment to rent. And, there is and a the draw of Mount Snow is that some kids are skilled skiers already, and part of the draw of Mount Snow is they can go ski black diamonds, black diamonds or whatever. Yeah. But the the real thing is, and we looked at this at the, at the endowment level too when we was doing it. There are no skis in someone's barn that you can outfit all of these kids. Right. They don't exist. When what you're talking about does not exist anymore. That was one individual in town that kept a whole bunch of skis and the secondary part of that is the liability that nobody would want to keep those skis because you'd be sued. You also can't count on there being snow. On that mm -hmm. Right. Well, right. we do make snow there, but yeah. Not yeah, yeah. You have to have cold weather too. So the other thought I had is the endowment part that we asked Frank to have the money manager take over. If we could look at having that money sent aside, whatever that generates, to the winter sports program, which is the whole point of the Bradwell School Endowment. But at least, and we can't commingle these funds, which would generate more money, but. Well, here it says endowment is paying 250. That's the Bradwell School Endowment okay. that we raise funds every year and give out a small amount. Okay, to that's a small amount because you're still building here. We don't okay. touch the principal. Yeah. So principal. If that's fundraising that we do individually just to fund this. This, uh, this looks like, this whole thing looks like it is no expense to the schools. Is it to, to the Right now, no. Not it's all being raised. Yes. But it's Well, there's hard. one item on here that is field from our school budget. This is something that was diverted from playing for school oh. field trips that is our, in our budget. Well, I should clarify, that's actually given to us from ACT. Oh, okay. So there's nothing. Okay. Yeah, so this nothing is all. Oh, I yeah. thought I was just wondering. So why are we? We're talking our, about if we should be paying for this instead of relying on fundraising from the parents, 100 percent. That's why we looked out of the budget and into this. So we maybe also, you sorry. guys. Sorry, I was just going to say to wrap that up. Maybe we could have you look at a number that maybe makes sense to put into the budget that would alleviate. Mm -hmm alleviate some of the stress on the parent groups and allow the parent groups to still be doing the other work that's so vital in the okay. schools. And see where we're at on the budget. You know, the dream budget, the reality budget. We did have a conversation uh, with our ACT members, our co-chairs, about possibly increasing the cost that students are asked to pay if they're going to Mount Snow. And what are they at now? Fifty dollars is the suggested donation for all kids doing winter sports. Mm -hmm. I raised it from 35 to 50 when I was there, so it hasn't been. Mm -hmm. it, it does make sense if, if students are going to Mount Snow, where it costs exponentially more than... It's still a good... I mean, well, it seems like it's, it's, it's costing about, about right, but now 600 it does. bucks per kid, so they're uh, just getting a good bargain for mm -hmm. 50 bucks. I would be in favor of the taxpayer footing the entire bill if we took out Mount Snow. Why? Well, then you could just say we paid five thousand dollars. We could contribute five thousand dollars and let the schools fundraise for Mount Snow if they want to. Yeah. Why do you want to take out? Well, it just seems like a pretty luxurious compared to all the others. It seems like a fairly luxurious. Uh, so the point of why of the Brattleboro School Endowment has so actively supported winter sports is because if the schools don't, and that's why we always try not to have those kids pay more to go to Mount Snow. There's a whole bunch of kids who could never afford to go skiing in their life yeah. if they didn't have the winter sports wondering. program. Well, did you grow up here? Did you have winter no, sports? No, but I was in the Northeast and friends would go skiing and I built snow forts or throw snowballs and did whatever I did. 125. Right. Uh, well, the beauty of the program it's a great we, <clears throat> The beauty of the program is we've taught um, many kids a lifelong skill. And if you're living in Vermont, 
knowing how to mm -hmm. ski is, sure. is a wonderful thing. And it gets kids say, outside during the winter months, which is not an easy thing to do. There's also, um, you know, just, I don't want to get too capitalist on this, but the, there's some barriers, social barriers to adults who cannot ski that, you know, that's a place of like wheeling and dealing like a country club. So it's reducing a possible barrier for kids just by giving them this skill that allows them to enter into that world as an adult if they needed to. So I feel like there is value to it beyond just the obvious value of being outside and doing a really fun, healthy activity and getting to enjoy magnificence of skiing down a mountain. Hmm. Well, so we'll see what you guys want to bring yeah. in the budget, right? Mm -hmm. Moving on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Fundraising, do we want to talk anything more about that? I think that was on, in general, just yep. to match with winter sports. And then what's under other, before we get to next agenda item, is the sabbatical. Remember you two appointed me to be on the little yes. committee? So, Lyle? So, the sabbatical committee met uh, this week. Uh, Jill represented Brattleboro um, School Board. There was a WSEA union representative, Aaron Hillo. Um, we reviewed a sabbatical request from Alice Sharks. And did, I, uh, did you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, which included a number of, of uh, travel opportunities where she would take half a year, go to a number of French speaking countries, visit schools, um, and then bring that information back to her classes um, at Green Street School. Uh, so the bottom line is that the uh, committee does not recommend that the board approve this, um, but would you like to give some more details? I think that was so for for this request. I was so I went into this. I don't know if Alice is watching because I haven't spoken to her yet. I said I would definitely do that if she wanted. I went into this thinking how how generous this sabbatical idea was and where this came from. Um, the policy actually says you can request up to an entire year as long as you've had six full years of employment and you would be paid full benefits, full salary and have the year to take a sabbatical and the process is what Alice did. And Alice has a, a really a fantastic supporting documentation of why she would want to do this and um, where she would go, how it would come back and directly benefit the kids and the teachers and the environment that she supports here. Um, it was only for a half a year. So, I, and I laughed when Lyle gave us because I said of all the teaching staff, for me the easiest question would be a foreign language teacher. Definitely I can see the value of taking that sort of a sabbatical. The difficulty I have as a school board member, however, is to justify taking um, someone out of the classroom and paying for the entire time that they're out and also paying for a full long-term substitute, which in this case, such as a long-term person would be under benefits as well. So, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the cost gets quite quickly quite expensive. And so I said I couldn't support the entire six months in this request. And um, yet, I was hopeful that we could talk about it as a board in revising this policy, which Lyle looked up the last time that someone applied for it was 1997. We don't know when the policy was written. But I, I mean, I just can't see any board right now ever saying, yeah, 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 we'll pay for an entire year and benefits and another teacher and benefits just to go sabbatical, unless you guys maybe all think it's differently. I would like to, to look at this sabbatical new policy and say, maybe as a supervisor union level, and say that we'd set aside sabbatical, you know, or we would consider sabbatical requests safe for one month or for two weeks. Because I, I could definitely see value of a foreign language teacher taking two weeks and or three or four weeks and immersing herself into that culture again and 
feeling like she could bring that back and getting something that would be valuable for this too. There's always the question of the summer, and maybe it's not a sabbatical, maybe it's even a program you know, over the summer that someone does and we support in some way or something. But, and I, I don't want to discredit and just say never any sabbaticals. I see the value in that, but I could support a half year in this position. That's our recommendation. Now the board, you all get to decide whether you agree with our recommendation or if you want to grant this. Well, the first thing that occurs to me is uh, perhaps another way of looking at it and offering a year's worth of benefits, but no salary. Mm -hmm. And they, they can also take a leave of absence. When you take a leave of absence, do you keep benefits? Uh, you pay them as well. I think you go on corporate. I think you go on corporate. So that's true too. That could be something. So I guess it's a two-part question. The first one is that we do have to actually decide whether you go along with my recommendation or or the committee's recommendation, or if you go would like to support. Alice now, who is the committee besides what? yourself? Should we do a, Aaron, should Aaron. We do a motion to uh, a motion so that we can discuss yes. this? I move we. Oh, I move we. Support, or support, support Jill's the committee's. the committee's determination not to approve the sabbatical. So we have a second so we can discuss further? Second. Right, okay. So any more discussion on that specific sabbatical request? I'm wondering what the principals think might be a reasonable solution to this. To be honest, I haven't seen the request or the details of it, so okay. it's hard for me to speak on that. Um, well, I just meant more generally about Jill's idea that could we create a policy that allows teachers to do some kind of far off thing, but that wouldn't have such an intense financial impact on the school. I mean... I think that the caution I have is the greatest impact we have on kids is being in front of them. Mm -hmm. And when we're taking teachers out of the classroom, it has a it has a major impact. So what about a summer program, though? That'd be great. I mean, that's, that's, that's much different. Because so we're putting we're not, a money towards. Right. I mean, but how is that different than what people can already access through mm -hmm. applying for grants from the school, like one percent and things like that? Well, the one percent maximum is I asked that two two, two days, two days. Right? because we have so, so many people that mm -hmm. that's like three hundred dollars yeah. total usually yeah. for any one thing. And so. they also have course reimbursement, but it, um, for the most part, it cannot be used for like a plane ticket to go and hotel. Okay. And, I mean, I, and I'm I don't know whether the better way to do it is. We say that we put three thousand dollars aside, and that's available, and people have to ask for it, and maybe it never gets used, or ten thousand, or whatever, some number, or if it gets into the contract at some point, I don't know. How right. So this is part. This is part of the negotiated teacher agreement. So we would not be able to change this until we start to rene renegotiate, which will be next, next fall. The negotiated agreement says that teachers are allowed to apply for this and this and the committee does not have to say yes to any of the requests. Exactly. So it seems like what you're trying to ask for is something that would give the teachers more of a chance at actually getting to go and do the thing. So we're sort of like reverse negotiating this. That right. Saying I, that like we're probably never going to say yes to someone taking six months or a year off paid from the classroom. <laughs> but what could we offer that we might actually say yes to? And that would really benefit the students. And I, I hear you, Mark, that's a really great way of putting it. But over the summer, right now, we don't offer any opportunity for teachers. Uh, I mean, the other sabbatical leave request that came to us was um, an SU employee. So I guess I'll talk about it tomorrow. Can yeah, we, I'm sorry, can I just ask more question about this application? Did she have something specific in the application why she couldn't do this in the summertime? Yeah, she had a longer. She had many like, places. Yeah, she's places. Going. Right. But like, why it wasn't just like I'll start in June and then I'll come back in October. Like, why was it during the yeah. school year? Was it a specific program that was only happening during the school year? Yeah. No, there's one section that was a program with someone else, but I think that timing could be whenever. Yeah. I think it just matched for one semester. The other thing. 
going into schools, she would have to do it when schools are in session. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a second sabbatical requested. Um, the teacher requesting it is Heidi Pancake. She is a WSESU employee, but she works in a Broadboro Town school. Um, the WSESU board did um, appoint Jill to look at that one as well. So we met as a committee and looked at both of these. Um, and the policy, the uh, negotiated agreement does say the board from the town in which the teacher works. Um, it's a little bit of an outdated language because when this was created, there was probably not a WSESU that encompassed teachers. Um, but because it does say Broadboro Town, we should probably bring that one to you, but it will also be taken to WSESU tomorrow evening to be voted on there. Um, and uh, Heidi Pancakes was um, a number of different courses to, uh, to complete her elementary education endorsement, creating an ESOL parent literacy and support group where she would reach out to um, ELL parents um, and create uh, a, a way for them to work together and talk together and have a better idea of what it means to be a United States citizen going to school here. And then a forest garden education um, and uh, creating um, like forest after school program for academy. And an ESL after school or just general? Forest. forest. Using After the forest outside. Using the forest outside. She's our current garden coordinator, so it's one of her paths. Okay, unrelated to her role as the right. ELM right. person. Right. Okay, that's what I was just asking. And <laughs> I understood forest. I just didn't understand <laughs> if this was specific to the ELM. I keep telling you forest. You know the thing with the trees. <laughs> Got the forest part. <laughs> yeah. um, and one of the things that we had talked about with this is that WSESU budget is riffing um, a, a position. And it's very hard to support uh, creating, uh, giving a sabbatical when we're already having to cut a teaching position. Uh, so that was. Wait, what teaching position are we cutting? Um, we will be cutting an ELL position. Oh. That's on the SU budget, the so SU that's why budget. we haven't talked okay. about it here. I didn't know about it either. Well, one thing that strikes me is that uh, essentially this is about a Seventy thousand dollar package. That's what I calculated. Yeah. And that seems like quite a fringe benefit for six years of service in the in the system. So we have a motion on the floor, and that's the only one we have to vote on um, because the SU budget or SU committee will do that tomorrow for this battle for Heidi. So can we? Are you ready to vote? on the sabbatical for Alice Sharks. All in favor, well the motion you said is to support, that we support your, your decision, decision to, to not, not approve. approve. So if you're voting yes, you're supporting saying no. We could revise it and say we It's all right. Going. It's okay. We okay. support okay. Jill's recommendation. Okay. 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 Yeah. We, we, we can hold yeah. two things. Yeah. <laughs> so all in favor. Say. Right. All in favor of Jill's of motion. Kim's motion. Yes. To, to not support, support the sabbatical request. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say I would regret. Yes. I wish that we could. The other thing that I said that I wanted to say publicly is that I think both of these teachers are fabulous, and I don't. That's why I was frustrated with this request because it's too much for anything that I felt like I could support. But I wanted us to look at some sort of another way to do that. I'm going to say I, and that we consider developing a layaway plan and start putting a little fund aside so that there's an exit because we'll never be able to support one of these things. I'm not even sure why they're still negotiating since it's not really a benefit. But if we thought, you know, if we put a little bit in every year. Well, we don't have to, I mean, we don't have to renegotiate this policy. We could just leave it as it is, but then also Fun. make a fund for someone doing a summer program yeah. or a summer travel or whatever. Or intensive over the yeah, that would, winter. We'd have to negotiate that too, but sure. <laughs> well, do we have to negotiate, make an entire policy, I guess so. 
I think it's two separate things. Mm -hmm. This is negotiated as, as someone said, a teacher benefit. Um, we could create our own local policy. For the local people for the next couple months. Mm -hmm. Or local board policies will continue to be local school policies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I have, has somebody come to ask for sabbatical without pay? And been approved? Um, so at the high school, there's a person that's yep. asked for a leave without pay. Okay. And so there is a teacher that's taking a half year, um, but not being paid, and that was approved. Yes. I mean, we've approved leaves on this board before too for people to go do another mm -hmm. professional opportunity. Okay. So the only thing left on the agenda is to look at next agenda. But Jerry has snuck in. Would you like to say anything, Jerry? Did you have a good band concert? We had a great band concert, <laughs> yeah. We had a great band concert, so I'm sorry that I'm late, but um, you know, uh, we have a, a new uh, music director, Kate Billings, um, who, um, you know, she's got, a, she's got a full plate. She's with us three days a week, and she does all school sing every Wednesday, and uh, beginner band, intermediate band, um, general music all around, chorus, so she's got a full plate, and uh, She's, she's young and she's exciting and she's bubbly and she did a great job. The kids did a great job. So um, yeah, I'm on a I'm on a high. So um, I decided to come over. I want to share that. <laughs> there you go. So thank you. So for our next agenda, we have Green Street Focus is going to be the beginning, and then we're going to go into the first reading of the budget, looking at the fund balance for Brattleboro and looking at the representation of Brattleboro on the transitional board. Anything else that needs to be added? And then on January 2nd, I did remove the social worker report because that'll be encompassed in the Green Street focus on December 19th and the Oak Grove focus on January 16th. So. Do you want to revisit any of the things that, um, well, not tonight, after Christmas. But I did. Um, what are you wanting to revisit over there? No, I just, we talked about leadership councils, and there are two or three things that we talked about, uh, getting more uh, in community engagement, getting people to come to meetings, things like that, that um, we've talked about but haven't really come back well, to. Well, the leadership council we came back to that last meeting, we asked for feedback, but we haven't actually, what's, what is our next step with that? Well, we've had feedback because, I mean, your conversation with Michaela was pretty big, and we heard from the administrators that they've been talk to the parent groups. But I did draft, I put together the information that Spoon had and what was in the articles, not all of it, into a kind of just a draft of responsibilities for leadership council. Maybe copies for everybody in the set one department to, to put up just for, just for perusing um, to give some sort of frame to what it actually, what, you know, what it would be, what would be happening. I hope there are enough there, if not enough. So I'd like to put that on the next, on a later agenda. Maybe it shouldn't be the 19th, necessarily. After Oak Grove. Maybe we'll put it on for the 16th after the Oak Grove focus, but I think our next step is to actually form them. Can I ask well, a question? We can see, I mean, the, well, we should wait and see a little bit uh, in terms of what's going to happen with the, if the, the legal appeal, if there's an injunction, then yes, we should just go ahead and call it. If, if, um, if not, then we should shift that over to the transition board. And, and, uh, I'm putting it on for the 16th so it comes back. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even if it doesn't come up with the transitional board, there's nothing that says that we could not um, create these. Well, here. actually, the, um, the, Default articles, and this is actually, it's not, it's in here, but they don't cite the fact that it's in Act 49. Um, if the transition board wants to adopt, for instance, the articles that the study committee developed okay. with a couple of changes, you've got the first 90, day, you do it 90 days, call a special meeting of the new thing, and just 
adopt those articles. Like not completely, because there are things in here that yeah. are added. But, but you could amend the board. Yeah, the yeah board's with the vote. Yeah, idea. with the vote of the people that come to that. Uh, and it's like a town meeting. Yeah. Exactly. So we could put those leadership councils in as part of our articles of agreement if we wish. Yeah, along with well, the other, uh, the other and also with the election and the school, you know, how, how many board members, the school closure things that are very different than what's in the art in the, the defaults. So um, things that you work, you spent a lot of time working out so that it would work for everybody. You could actually. I don't know if the school closure one can go into it. I think that was on the list that you can't. No, Is that one of the ones you can't? You can't. Yeah. For two years, yeah. you can't. Yeah. Right. Closing classrooms yeah. or grades yeah. or schools. Yeah, I, I didn't pay much attention to that part of it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't pay attention to things you can't do. Anything else for the agenda? Are we ready for a motion to adjourn? So moved. Anybody second? second All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all.